Sometimes life takes unexpected turns and our dreams seem to fade away from what they once were. But within each of us lies a reservoir of resilience and strength that can carry us through even the darkest of times. And take it from me, it is never too late to dust off those dreams and paint a new picture and redefine your path. Starting over doesn't mean forgetting the past or erasing the chapters that brought you here. It means embracing the lessons, the triumphs, and the trials that have shaped you. It means accepting that life is a journey of growth. And with each step forward, we evolve into a wiser, more compassionate, more abundant, more elevated version of ourselves. You know, all I wanted to do since I was 13 was be a TV newscaster. I was fixated on it. I got into a top college for it. I was on air for NBC starting at age 20 until that wasn't meant for me anymore. And then there was a period of reprieve where I went from being on TV to picking up dog shit on Ventura Boulevard in Studio City, California, working at a doggy daycare because I had to deal with my mental health because I was crumbling and it was not cute. And then I took another path and I got into the world of pharmaceutical sales and I climbed that corporate ladder and I became a national sales trainer. Then I was a manager and a director. And then I started a side hustle. And then I started my first business, which I still have to this day, 16 years later. And then 10 years into that business, I finally launched this show that you're listening to now, which is about four and a half years ago. It took me that long to do it. You can evolve. You can decide to change. You can zig. You can zag. It's your life. It's all up to you. And starting over, whether it's in your personal life or professionally, is not a sign of failure. In fact, it's a testament to your resilience and a celebration of our infinite capacity for growth. Let's together seize this moment and embrace the beautiful adventure of starting over again in any area of your life. And today's interview with my guest is a beautiful example of she was fixated and focused on one path, on one path, on one path, and people celebrated her for it. People admired her for it. Very few people could have achieved what she achieved. And she had to give herself permission to go a different direction, even when everyone else was saying you're absolutely crazy for throwing all of this away. What up, my people, my posse, my fellow crazies? This is your host, Tiffany Carter, and you are listening to the show that is going to help you grow your business, your bank account, that big, beautiful brain of yours, your abundance, your relationships, and everything in between. So you all know that I am really discerning on calling out bullshit. And there is a lot of bullshit online, as we know, in the social media space to the point where I know some of you avoid social media or then are even in resistance to show up on it for your own business because the last thing you want to be is one of those people or you don't look like those people or your life isn't as exciting or as glamorous. And I recently, I don't know, what was it? Maybe three, four months ago, decided to go into the TikTok land. And apparently people like me there. So I went viral a few times. Lots of great things happen. And I scrolled a little bit. You know how I feel about too much scrolling. I end up deciding I hate myself in my life after a short period of time. So I don't scroll that much. But my guest today, Low Silver, was so refreshing to see. She was straight up. I felt like almost like we were related in some way, like. <laughs> Just straight up, no fantasy marketing, telling the shiz like it is. And I was like, oh my God, thank God there's someone else out there that's keeping it real for people because it's such a disservice when people are just giving you that fantasy marketing or telling you what you want to hear. And I've fallen for it too in all different areas. It can be fitness, it can be money, it can be business, it can be social media growth. But it never ends up getting us where we want to go. It just pacifies us at the time. And you end up wasting a lot of money because you buy shit from these people and it ends up getting you nowhere because you're resistant almost to someone like myself, maybe, and like low, because it's like, oh, wow, like I'm going to really have to show up for this person or they're saying I have to do this, that and the other. Well, it's the it's the truth. 
right? It's, it's the truth. And sometimes the truth isn't cute, but that's, what's going to get you the cash. So I had to bring her on the show and hear her story. Welcome Lo. Hey guys. <laughs> well, let's first talk about the fact that you were a professional athlete, which that's not something I notice you lead with right in your content, which is interesting because there's other former or retired professional athletes online where that's like a lead story marker. And I notice you don't do that. Like I didn't realize that until probably, I don't know. I was deep, on, deep on your videos, probably like 27 videos deep. And I was like, Oh, interesting. I had no idea. So what, first of all, why is that not something you lead with? Because I feel like it's really easy to use crutches and like being an athlete, it's really easy to use a space and leverage it. But also I didn't want to be pigeonholed in a space because what I do with helping people build their businesses online has nothing to do with where you come from. And so I think if I, which when I first started out on my journey, I, I did lean into that. Like a lot on my Instagram, when I first started on Instagram, before I got onto TikTok, that's what I leaned into because that's all I knew. And so as I began to pivot as an entrepreneur and I became, I, be, I became more seasoned in my entrepreneurial journey, I pivoted, I grew, we, we constantly evolved. So soccer was and never isn't, and it never was my identity as a person. So I wasn't going to bring that into my entrepreneurship. And I, I realized I could help more people. But when I first started, I did lean into that a little bit more because that is where I was getting most of my clientele because they knew me from sports and from soccer, they knew I was an athlete. So they knew that I would get their, their predicament. So that was the ideal client that I was working with at the time. But I feel like as I evolved and I just became a whole different person, essentially, as we continue to grow, like I didn't need to only serve that, that market. I had more of, I had more to give. And so when I switched over to TikTok, because soccer was always something that I could lean on because I was really good at it. I was like, fuck that. <laughs> I'm just going to, go all in on this other part of myself and see what I can really do. And I think, I think that's what a lot of people do is they get in their comfort zone. And I honestly think that's the thing that holds you back. And I kind of ripped that off and was like, okay, like, let's just show up and be this version of low and people are going to be about it. And if people aren't, then, you know, they aren't. See, this is what I love about her. She's <laughs> like, has the natural zero fucks vibe. Did you always have the ZFG vibe going on, or is this something that you've done a lot of like internal work on and you've morphed into this? I honestly think I was like further on the spectrum. I think I was like, <laughs> like the fucks were of negative, like in the negative range because you of just gave way too few fucks. <laughs> yeah. Like there was, there was probably more fucks that should have been given. And I feel like I was giving like the least and so I actually had to kind of work and do the self-reflection and the growth to start to give some fucks, but just enough where it was a good boundary and space for me, but also like for my audience to understand, okay, like she is really cool. She just kind of has resting bitch face or she like, I was just really straight to the point. So I think I had to kind of come from the other spectrum of like adhering and meeting people where they were and understanding everyone has their story and situation. And I can't really judge that. We all have our childhood trauma that we hold on to. And I think that that had a big effect on the way that I showed up. And so that negative scope I had on life really, I think, affected everything else. So the 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 negative fucks that I gave had to kind of be, I had to add some positive to that. And I think I got to a nice little balance where I still really have zero fucks to things that I don't care about that have nothing to do with me. I avoid everything that has nothing to do with anything that I want to do in my life. If it's not going to benefit me, zero, zero fucks. But for the things that I know will and the people that I know that I can help, it's finding that balance between let me still be direct with you. Let me be the direct, serious, straightforward low, but also let me give you grace. And like, let me show you that like we're human and we can, we can be on the same level and we can talk about the same things and, and laugh about some things too. Where did that come from? Cause it's rare that I encounter people who are like that. And I see some of my, my old self in you mm -hmm. where for me going through a lot of childhood abuse, it was like a defense mechanism. Like I'm going to basically like have not just a wall up, but like a yeah. fortress up. Yeah. And it was kind of like, it was zero fucks in an unhealthy way. Where yeah. did yours come from? I mean, that's very similar for me growing up. I was 
like they always talk about childhood trauma and they talk about children and the stress you have to have as a child and how that carries into like your body and it carries into like your mind and the way you think and the way you act and the way you speak. And so I was very misunderstood, I think, growing up a lot because of the way I came across. And from my childhood, I would experience a lot of stress. I was put in positions where I had to tend for my siblings at a very, very young age, alone by myself, living alone with them. A lot of the physical and verbal abuse I experienced as a child, it put me in a position where I didn't want to be intimate. I didn't want to be close. I felt I felt like if people were trying to be close with me, that it was fake or superficial, that they were going to hurt me. And so because of that, I think that was the really like standoff, like get out of here, hand in the face type of thing. And again, that's a very misunderstood, misconstrued version of who I am. As you turn into your later teens and your twenties. And now that I turned 30 this year, actually, damn, (laughs) (laughs) you go through like these, these, like these little, you go through your twenties and now into my thirties and in college is where I spent a lot of time, like reflecting on this. And I think as, because I was an athlete and because I played a team sport, it was really easy to see your own flaws amongst a lot of other people, because when you play team sports and when you're in a team environment, like every it's in your face every day all day long a lot of times people don't get that accountability so it becomes very difficult to like grow and to and to see yourself because you're alone or you go through you're not in these massive settings but I think when you're a part of a team and this team is top 10 in the country and you have to perform and you have to do well and you're not playing or something's going wrong at the end of the day like the common denominator isn't everyone else is you so I think that really helped open to, open my eyes to see, okay, like what's really happening here. And then I think moving through that and growing through that. And then that's where I had to kind of like get out of this negative space and kind of jump into like this more neutral space and positive space where I can say, okay, like not everyone is here to hurt me and I can, I can actually just flourish and like let go of some of these things. But I think the letting go process is actually the hardest thing for a lot of people. If you can't overcome that, like good luck with everything else. Yeah. It's a lot of damn work. And wow, you've accomplished so much internal and external work at such a young age. That's incredible. Where does this level of like discipline and tenacity come from? Because there's no professional athlete in the world that doesn't have that. And there's no successful entrepreneur that doesn't have it. And you've had both. Like, were you born with this? Do you have to dig for it every day? I'm the middle child. (laughs) Okay. So I think middle child has the first child is like a lot of the experimentation. The young child is the the princess and the middle child is the one that most gets neglected. And so I think growing up, that was not that I was super neglected. Like my parents tried their best. I, I struggled had a really terrible relationship with my father, which we've overcome and I've had to really work and build a good relationship with him. And a lot of people can't do that. It takes that. How did I make that happen? It takes fucking time. But I think growing up, I was, there was a lot of pressure on me in that sense. I was always the kid that was the best at everything. I won all the things I was doing great in school. I never got into trouble with in terms of doing anything wrong or bad. And I think because of that stress growing up, it like conditioned me to having to have to have everything organized and prepared and structured and ready. And everything that is good is equally just as bad. So I had that, which was awesome. Great coping mechanism for my stress as a child. And so I put my head down and I was 4.3 GPA in school. I was playing on three different soccer teams, one for the country, one for my local community and one regionally. I was always busy. I had games every weekend. I was in school. I was at practice and I was shitting and eating. That was it. Wow. That was like my schedule. Even into college, I led right into that same type of process. And so I think as I got into that position, like that mindset for me was something that was built out of stress. And so as I saw it evolving in college, which is great for sports, it's not necessarily great for self relationship and other relationships. So yeah, I know I really struggled in those areas, which is why I dove into that a lot. So I think that comes from that scenario, but then I think it evolved into a really good positive type of mindset and attitude when I took responsibility of my trauma instead of allowing it to impact me for the rest of my life. When a lot of people hear that someone has a sexy background, let's say, without knowing like your childhood story and the whole backstory. I'm a former TV newscaster. It sounds sexy. Former professional athlete, sexy. Someone who's like a best-selling author. And I'm sure you have 
students and clients that come to you and say this, like, well, yeah, but you're, you are a professional athlete or you're gorgeous, or you're so well-spoken on camera. What's the other side to it? You know how you were saying there's always that there's the light side, there's the dark side. There's always a flip side to it. What's the flip side of it? Cause I could make a lot of assumptions about a professional athlete that yeah. you're like, you're sitting on millions over there. And this is kind of like a little bit of like a fun little, I guess I need to do something hobby and that you were on the cover of the Wheaties box or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think the reality here is number one, I'm a woman and I'm a woman of color and I'm a woman of color in sports and I'm bisexual and I'm Jewish and I'm I didn't black. know you were a Jew. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shout <laughs> but, out, you know, shout out to my Jews. Right. And I'm black and I'm white. I'm biracial. So you've got a lot of things I think going on. And I mean, as a professional athlete, like when I was, when I first finished school, I actually went pro before I actually finished college. I, I went pro played for a year, came back, finished school, graduated and then I immediately, right after six days after I graduated from college, I moved to Sweden, which is where I played um, professionally for a bit. And then I came back and packed my stuff. And then I went to Scotland. I went to Norway, France. I played in a lot of different countries. I played here in the US. I played for the Orlando Pride. Like I have been everywhere. And the harsh reality that people don't see is that as a woman athlete, we get paid below poverty. And I'm not going to go into that piece because... Well, we will literally be here for, I'm not even fucking kidding you, like three days. So I will start mini series. Oh, we will like, we might as well just like everyone be tune in for the next call because it's going to be a continuation of this conversation truly. But what happened was, is like, we don't get really the pay for women's soccer. Isn't really great at the time when I was playing pay was below poverty. Like, so think of poverty below that very low when soccer is the number one most played sport for young girls in America. So you would think weird. And I'd say the same, that is very strange. So I was getting paid below poverty, which makes all the traveling, all the things very difficult, even with working with agents and having conversations about negotiating what my needs are for a certain team, having to advocate for myself as a woman to my own agent about, I'm not going to go live in a home with five people or with strangers. I want to have my own space. So there's a lot of this glamour, I guess you could say, or glamification maybe is a word. Well, it's a word now. Okay, great. So like, you'll see this like idea and this romanticized version of being a professional athlete, but my partner plays in the NFL and our lives are completely different as athletes. Like they, we have a completely different journey. You see that, but don't understand all the things I had to go through. And I was essentially for 10 years living out of a suitcase because as an athlete, you are signed here and then you're not and you're here and you're there and whatever. So that idea of being settled down and being relaxed and in the midst of my professional journey, I also played in, I played in the women's world cup in 2018. I represented Jamaica. So I'm Jamaican. And in the midst of this, I'm still having to like pay my way to get to the world cup. And you would be like, Oh, like, that's weird. Like really? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's wild. Yeah. yeah it's, it's but insane. I'm also not surprised at the same time. Exactly. And that's the sick part. You're kind of like, it's like when you smell something really bad and then you smell it for a long time and then you kind of get used to it. You're like, <laughs> oh. like that is the same scenario. It's like, Oh, women don't get paid. Ah, but also like, wait, that's not good. But also like, we're used to this. That is literally the situation. I think traveling and like doing all the stuff I'm doing, everyone thinks like, oh, this is so amazing. And it looks like whatever, but it's, it is very difficult. You're paying your way to the world cup. And then we were actually, we made history. We were the first Caribbean team to ever qualify for a world cup ever. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. That's and cool. so you would also think that that would come with praise and, and money and, and, and something. And, status and power and opportunity. And it came with absolutely fucking nothing. We had to struggle with the Federation to get paid. There was just so many things that went on. So skipping over that journey, as I realized I got into the world cup, I kind of was like, I need something for me. And so that's when I like really buckled down. I had started this business about two years before I went to the world cup and I was living my dream of playing in the world cup that I, as a young athlete, you're always thinking, how do I get to the highest stage? of my, of this profession? How can I become the best of the best? Well, I was actually doing that. I was on the stage and I was like, okay, here I am. And I still felt like a piece of shit. And so 
having my business, that was like the thing that woke me up and I was like, okay, I need to go get what's mine. And so I think at the same time I was playing in the world cup and traveling. I was also running my business at the same time to provide a life for myself. So I was having to build out two different careers, one that's physically extremely taxing and mentally and a whole nother career that I think is, was very new for me. And for all the people out there who are like, I'm really struggling with finding my niche. I'm like, y'all, like, you don't even know what I had to do to to figure out what my niche was because I had to literally reinvent myself in order to find a career and to make the money and the impact and create the lifestyle that I wanted because it wasn't coming from the career I had spent 25 years of my life building. Right. I mean, that was your identity. And so someone could go, well, I would have thought you would have ended up being some sort of like, I don't know, fitness influencer or professional soccer influencer or something like that. Well, like coach, like you can be a coach, you can be a trainer, you can be, and that's what people, that's what some people do in the space. And that is the typical move is you do that or you do broadcasting or you do hosting and events like that. But as much as that is dope and I still want to do those things, the, the experience I have with living overseas, um, the knowledge I gained from that and then the knowledge I gained from the experience for just like grabbing the bull by the horns and like diving fully, like fully deep into this business space that I had so much more to share. And I had so much more impact than just that. And I'm not saying that's not good enough, but it wasn't good enough for me. And so I wanted to do more. I wanted to be, I wanted to be known. I wanted to be the most known person in this, like in the world. I wanted to have the most amount of impact. I want people to meet me and hear me and be like, holy shit, I can't believe I didn't meet this person earlier. Like genuinely, I want to have that type of impact on people. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to do that or I didn't want to do that in the coaching space. Mm. So how did you get from, how did you get from that to where, because to find out where you want to go, you guys, one of the best ways is to also take note of where you don't want to go and where you don't want to spend your energy. So you did that, right? I know I don't want to give more energy and time and attention to this. So how did you determine what you wanted to build this business around? Yeah. So I knew that was a closed door because the energy I was giving wasn't the energy I was getting. Like there was zero reciprocation. And so I was tired of giving to a space that maybe in this time in the world that we live in does not have the ability to give back to me. And so I respect where we're at with women's sports, but it's just something for me that I didn't want to keep playing into. There are going to be other, other messengers for that space. And it wasn't me, but the piece that really turned everything around for me was before I went to the world cup, I, I remember I was on, I, I was on Instagram. I had a thousand something followers. And at the time, my goal, however long ago that was brand partnerships, weren't really a thing like they are now. Okay. So back then you think of brand partnerships, like professional athletes who get partnerships with Nike or get sponsored, right? That was actually really harder to come by. It was very difficult to do that. Now it's, that is the world we're living in and, and brand influencer marketing. Like that is a thing. It's kind of easier to get marketing deals than it was back then. It's more prevalent. I would say back then it was like, that was a rarity. You didn't see it. It was very hard. It was a big triumph. If you got sponsored, it was like, wow, that's amazing. So as an athlete who had just finished college, who was trying to go and play pro and get opportunities, I wanted to be a Nike athlete so bad. Like that was like, I think my most athletes do. We're, they, we're mean, actually kind of programmed because they're genius marketers and they're wanting yeah, that. Exactly. So I was like, I really want to be a Nike athlete and or just sponsored by anyone before the World Cup. And so when I went on this journey, this was before the World, World Cup, like I would say like three years before that, I was actually still like in college. Remember, I went pro, came back. And when I came back, I was like, all right, I'm going to go back playing pro. Let's get sponsorship deals, right? Let's make this happen before I leave college. So funny story, my current COO, Sarah, she and I went to the same college and she was there when I came back because she had just come in as a freshman and her and I started working together on trying to grow my influence. And I, back then I didn't know it was called influence, but I wanted to grow my followers because I was like, well, Nike is never going to take a meeting with me if I have less than 50,000 followers. So like, let's grow my following. So at 1,371 followers, me and Sarah were like, let's embark on this journey. We're going to make this shit happen. So at the time I didn't have a monetized business. I wasn't selling anything. So I was getting online very organically and just showing people my lifestyle as an athlete, as a professional athlete. Like this is what I do. Like this is welcome to my life. This is how I eat. This is how I train. Just very basic kind of organic stuff. And so building this rapport with the audience, I actually started to grow my following a little bit. 
People were DMing me, asking me questions, like just creating conversations. So I really generated this organic, super natural, just relaxed audience that gave a shit about me. And I didn't have to sell them anything because I didn't have anything to sell. I didn't even know that that was a thing. Remember, I'm young, low. I had no idea. And so I was like, yeah, this is what this looked like. We can grow a following to 50,000 and Nike's going to have a conversation with us. So we were working on that for a long time. And I actually have a video of me when we finally hit 5,000 followers from college. And we hit 5,000 followers. We took this video in the bathroom. We were so excited. We were so lit. You're like, yo, like, can't believe this happened. It's like, we're so excited. We worked so hard for this. And I hit that, that small little feet and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Well, at that time, I didn't know it, but I was already kind of building the business I have now. Mm. And I didn't know. Right. So this is all in retrospect. Right. So I I get the 5,000 followers. We're celebrating. We're super excited. And my following then actually starts to increase pretty steadily after that. So we're going from five to six, six to seven to 10, and we're growing to 11, 12. And at this point, a couple of years are now going by. The World Cup is coming up. I actually switched sports, not going to get into that either, but I, I got recruited by USA Weightlifting to do Olympic lifting, did that for eight months, wasn't into it, it was too much sitting. So, uh. and then Jamaica called me and was like, hey, we're qualifying for the World Cup. We want you to play with us. And I originally had said no. Really? <laughs> because I already, yeah, because in college, because in college, while I was playing college soccer, because in soccer, it's different. You can play like nationally, you can play club which is locally and you can play regionally and like there are so many there's so much with soccer and in college I was playing for the University of Florida which is where I went to school and there was a world cup cycle coming and they called me to come in I went in and that that time we did try to make to qualify for the world cup we had to go through a couple tournaments we made it to the final round essentially which is called CONCACAF and we didn't end up qualifying that time. But the bullshit we went through with the Federation really put a bad taste in my mouth. And I didn't want to put myself in that position. So the disdain and the discomfort I had with it, I was already like, no. So they called again. And I said to them, um, no, or I need to think about this, right? And then I was doing the Olympic lifting. And I hate the Olympic lifting so much. I was like, you know what? Fine, I'll do this. So we ended up doing that. And so in this time, like I said, I'm growing my following. And I'm at this point where about a year before the World Cup, And so my agent and I were having conversations. I was like, yeah, I really want to be sponsored by Nike and all these people and whatever. We're setting up calls with Nike and Adidas and Under Armour, all these people who are just coming to us and essentially pretty much saying like, no, like you are not good enough. We don't want you. That's what they're saying when they're saying no. You don't have enough followers. You don't have enough viewership or offering me really shitty deals. And I'm just like, so I told my agent, I was like, you know what? Okay, like this is where we're at. We have to keep growing the following. So I get up and we're getting closer and closer to the World Cup. My following increases to like 25,000, 24,000, whatever. And guess who calls? Nike. Nike, Adidas, Under Armour, Puma. My agent starts having conversations and they start offering actual things. And so I said, no. What? Why? Because at this point, over the past three years, I had grown from 1,000 followers and zero influence to 24,000 followers, I started to create my own brand, my own name, which was, which is silver, but gold. So my name is Lauren Silver, but everything I do is gold. And that's the motto. And I started to understand the online space and how it works and how much opportunity. And so by making, creating partnerships with certain brands, the exclusivity that goes with that wasn't something that I wanted because I now knew I had way more influence and leverage if I wasn't attached to a brand than if I was. And so the thing that I always desired and always wanted was the thing I no longer desired anymore. And it wasn't what I needed anymore to be, to, to get to where I'm at. So I went to the world cup as a non-sponsored athlete. And once I got to the world cup and went through all of that to, to play, that was like the moment where I just really recognized to kind of pull back full circle. Like, this is not the place where I want my energy to be. This isn't even how I want people to see me. Like y'all wait for the influence I'm about to create because soccer is just this big in comparison to what everything else is in the world. And so after the World Cup, I actually took a year off from soccer. I ended up going back, but I took a year off and I built this empire. And that's when I was like, let's redefine who I am. Let's redefine and, and let's go from here. And so that's where I sat down and I came up with silver, but gold and I made that an official. I trademarked it. Like, I was like, maybe that's the thing that's really going to just put the stamp on it. But I was like, I trademarked this. This is what we're doing. I opened up my, my first like, you know, website or with Kajabi started building out some things and I just went forward and moved forward with that. And so I took everything that I had 
And that's where I was saying earlier with the crutch or leaning into sports when I first started. And I said, all these people had started reaching out to me and saying, hey, Lo, like, how did you grow your following? Because that was the question now. Like, I had now grown to 25,000 followers. I also got verified on, on, on Instagram, which was like a big deal. And at the time when you couldn't buy it or whatever, like it was, that was the thing, a staple as an athlete to get verified. Yeah. And especially women athletes, it's not, it's not as easy. Like people think like, oh, she plays sports, she should get verified. All of my, no, none of the rest of my teammates were verified except for me. Wow. But it was because not of, either. because it was the influence I grew. It had nothing to do with the sport. They didn't even qualify that. Instagram thinks women's sports are, is it was a joke. So they, they didn't even count that. Like it was so incredibly hard to get verified. So I just was like, I'm not even gonna worry about that. And I just worried about the audience and building the rapport, built the audience. Like I said, I started then getting people who are reaching out and saying, hey, Lo, like, how are you growing your following? How are you growing following? Your content's so good. And so the shift in conversation actually started happening for my audience. It was still attached to soccer, but they were like, your content is so good. Like, how did you grow your following? And I never had this skill. I didn't know what I could do with myself. Didn't know where it was gonna come from, but those questions were coming and I was paying attention and I recognized, oh, there's a need here. Let me dive into it. And that's when I, after and the it was up, a need that like, obviously you enjoy right. and it lights you up because there's other needs on the soccer side that 100. are very obvious, oh, but that, the amount of emails but, I got from, yeah, the amount of offers I got to do college coaching, the exactly. amount of offers I got from all, lots of other people. But again, it was a need. Like I always tell people there's a difference between being willing and wanting to do something versus being capable of doing something. I was, I'm capable of doing a lot. I, I can do a lot, but I'm willing and wanting to do only certain things. And this was one of them. So I chose this over that. I love this. You guys are like, oh, I need to follow her. Everything's in the show notes. You can swipe up, but it's at low, L-O underscore silver. I was wondering, is the silver like your legit last name or is this yeah. like a stage name? No, that, that's the Jew in me, silver. I mean, well, like I would have, if I saw like Silverstein or something, but yeah, like, I, I, yeah, okay. No. Okay. I feel like, I mean, yeah, you have, silver. you do have a lot of like interesting things. You've got a lot of stuff going on. So I can yeah. see when you said as a kid growing up, people kind of, people like as putting people in a box, it's like, right. you're not boxable. They don't right. know what to do with how like we still have which I think is so annoying. Like we still yeah. have to check these boxes. Like I was just getting like my knee looked at from a sports specialist yesterday. And there's all these boxes. Like, are we still checking all these fucking boxes? Yeah. But like you actually, there are no boxes for some of the shit oh, that you are. I, trust me. And I think honestly, for a lot of people who are listening to this, who are super dynamic people and y'all have a lot of things going on, I think one, you should celebrate that. But two, when you do have that, sometimes that's the thing that can be the hardest to determine like where to go. And I think like we need to give ourselves a little bit more grace with that because as humans, we are, we are multidimensional. And I think you can be good at a lot of things, but I, I always said, I always say this to everyone, like just pick something and start and fail as fast as possible. If that wasn't the one you'll know real fast. And the, think- the way that I didn't know this is because I started doing when I, I didn't get into coaching, but I did pick up like one client while I was in college. I was like, I'll just train this kid on the side. And then there was a, they wanted to bring someone else and someone else. And as soon as they brought the third person, I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. And I was like, this is not it for me. So I love soccer. I still watch it. The World Cup is happening right now. Watch women's sports, but I will support it. But I don't want in any way to shape this industry. And if I do, it can be kind of indirectly. Look at Lowe. She was able to do blank, blank, blank. And she came from soccer, then boom, that's my impact. But like, I don't even want to touch that space with a 10 foot pole because it's just not for me. But I just had to make that decision. What do you see as being the biggest misconception that business owners or people who are entrepreneurs have around growing their influence, their brand online? Biggest misconception is that your journey should or is going to look like someone else's. I think, well, there's a lot, I have a lot of misconceptions, but I think that that's a big one. When I, a lot of the clients I work with, when they come to work with me, they're like, oh, Lo is going to help me. So this is going to work. It's not going to, you got to make it work. Like, it's not just going to work because I'm going to give you all the things and that now you're working with me, it's going to happen for you you really have to put in the work. And I think on the other side of that, it's like the opposite. Like if you come to me and you're like, this isn't for me, there's no way I could have this abundance. There's no way people would follow me. There's no way my message is important. 
if you come in with that sort of energy, like that's literally what's going to happen. So again, no matter what I teach you, if you've got that energy, it's like, it's not going to happen. So the misconception is like, you know, that you're either going to have the result or not have the result when literally, believe it or not, I always say this, like entrepreneurship is like, you have to be type B with entrepreneurship and you have to be type A with the details. So like type B and as someone who is type A, I would get so hung up on filming perfectly. I would get so hung up on all the wrong details, extremely type A with shit that would keep me like so slow. And I really had to flip my mindset where I had to become very type B and my partner is type B. He's very like, he's very relaxed, very chill. Like he's just like, Hey guys, like what's going on? You know? I'm like, I'm like, we're fucking late. Like we're about to be late for this. We got to get to the airport. Do, 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 do. And I had to really flip that with my business. I had to be very graceful and like relaxed and know that this is going to pivot. And like, if that doesn't work, that I'm not even attached to the result. And so I just think that the misconception is like, you have to have a conception. Don't just do literally just do like, that's it. What would you say would grow people's audience the fastest in this time period online? Cause as we know, it's, it changes and compare social media to like a video game. There's mm -hmm. upgrades, there's updates, there's new levels. The stuff's always, is always changing. So you kind of have to go with it. So what worked five years ago isn't a vibe now. Right. What would you say is a vibe now? Cause you've worked with enough people at this point where you can pro or even when you're scrolling, you can probably go this per this person has it. Cause you, well, those of you on YouTube now, the show's on YouTube. Apparently you guys like, like watching, <laughs> watching us talk. It's the visual. They like the visual. <laughs> So go watch on YouTube. But like, that's how I felt when I saw you, Lo. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing this shit a long time. And I was like, yeah. she's got it. She's not full of shit. How refreshing. I like her. She's coming on the show. Seriously. Yeah. And I'm sure you have that feeling. Oh, no. When <laughs> someone like applies to work with you, there's tell us about that persona where it's like this person has the makeup. And they've, and they've got the sauce where this yeah. could really be a thing as long as they show up and do the work. Yeah. I think there's like a, two, like two different ways to look at it. And I kind of want to get a little bit technical so that everyone who's listening can like maybe take and actually apply some of these things. The first thing is a little bit more intangible. I think with the online space, there is an it factor that you have to have in order to be successful. So that's like just me speak, being very forward and forthright. You have to have the sauce in order to show up online and like get your audience to be into you. I do and I do think the best thing about what you can do for yourself as a person is to understand your strengths, to know your weaknesses, but to completely hide your weaknesses. People don't work with you because you suck at your content or you suck at this or you're not good at finances. They come to you because you're fucking good at whatever. So just lean into your strengths as much as possible. So when I say the it factor, you don't have to have the it factor like me where I'm like in your face, I'm gonna talk fast at you and like be like blah 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 blah. If your it factor is like a subtle confidence and you can speak like this and you can own the floor and you can have whatever, let that be your it factor. But I think it's about identifying those strengths and just like leaning into that as much as possible to identify what your it factor is. So I do think like there are people who have that it factor who can get on here and like capture an audience and, and like own it. And they just know like, damn, this girl has that thing. It's just like, she's sparkling. And I just want to like dunk her into my coffee. And like, you have that. But on the second point of this, for all my people who are like, well, I don't have the it factor. I believe you can own and train that. I do. I really, really do. And so some of the steps I just want to list off for you are the ways that you can start to get that it factor, but then actually start to grow that influence online and grow your following to understand who this person is. So the first thing I want to address is every day you get a choice. You get to wake up and say, I'm going to be a fucking badass and get after it. Or I'm going to feel sorry for myself. And like, I'm going to be insecure and sad. We can literally choose what you'd like to be that day. And there are days that I wake up, I'm going to lie where I'm like, I want to be sad. You know, I just stay in my bed. <laughs> but there are other days where I wake up and I'm like, I'm the fucking shit. I don't give a fuck what anybody's saying. Like, this I'm is the same thing. way. Like, I'm like. I, I want to hide and I hate everybody and I'm closing up shop right. or I'm like, I'm the fucking shit over here. Okay. Right. <laughs> so there's like that first choice that you get to make. And then when it comes to your content, one of the things I do every single day, I was just telling Tiffany this before we jumped on the call, I get dressed every day. I do my hair every day. I, I mean, she hair. has like a neck, her necklace stack game. 
there is it's funny this this shit is yeah i watch your videos just for that i'm like damn she's like got a real good eye for that stack <laughs> yeah so i think it's like you have to identify like what that is for you but i come up with like exactly what i want to how i need to feel to be my best because if i what just so everyone knows too like i struggled creating content if y'all scroll back on my inter instagram and go back back like you guys will see when i was like trying to build my my authority my voice online my coaching voice like you will see the x the cringe you'll be like whoa this is so embarrassing wow this is crazy i can't believe she posted this type of content if you really scroll back so i went through that phase and I realized the thing that really helped me was like getting dressed because I work from home and y'all probably work from home too. It's like, it is incredibly difficult to like switch that mindset and go from like sitting on the couch and like watching Netflix and eating breakfast to like getting on here and being like, all right, guys, like this is what you need I to mean. Do it is not home. lost on me. Obviously those of you looking at us right now, I but this is the perfect representation between knowing what your it factor is and knowing like how you need to show up for you. You want, like, and honestly, like I always say, like I do my best content after I run and the little top I wear the little, like I wear this like little one. It's by Aloe. It's, it's a really comfy top by the way, very supportive, but it's like a high neck sports bra and it cuts like right here. It's super short. I wear that in all my videos. So if you go on my page, y'all would be like, Oh, it's in gray. It's in black. It's in they white. Need, they need to throw you some cash for that. They really do. I trust me. I've already DM them like 20 times. <laughs> like, you know, call me, but also I've already done that. And it's like, I'll wear that little top and everyone thinks it's so cute, but it's literally a running top. I will do my makeup before my run. So but when you I come feel on, good in it, like you yes. feel like bomb in it. So that's yeah, what matters. And so when I get on camera, I feel like super confident and that's really important. That was the thing for me that helped me like switch my mind. Like, going from just being like here to here and just like putting on clothes and changing was the action I had to do to get my mind right. For some of you guys that might be meditating, for some of us, it might be reading, it might be having like a cup of coffee, it might be going for a walk. And that's the thing that gets you in the zone. And so in, in soccer, it's called, we call it different zones. So there's like zone one through zone five. And I need to be like in a, I need to be in a zone one, which is the lowest zone, the most like relaxed, calm zone. Some people, People need to put on hype music and get lit. And it's like, yeah, zone that's five. me. That's me. So yeah. I'm like a zone fiver. That's yeah. Me. And that's, yeah. and you know that, but we both need z different zones to be able to both get on the field together and perform our best. So it's like that identity and understanding that and having that awareness about yourself is a, a huge piece. And so when I was able to get into my zone one, I'm in my element, um, I'm relaxed. I've already worked out because I can't film before I don't work out. My brain is going too fast. I feel good. I'm looking at myself and I'm like, fuck, you look hot. Like, this is great. Then I can get on camera and I can bring the confidence, which is what most people struggle with. So like when I can do that, then I'm like ready to go. And so that within creating long form content is genuinely how I'm able to attract the audience I am because most people who watch my content either want to have the same results that I have or they want, they literally want to be me. Some aspect, whether that's physically whether that's vocally and I'm not talking, I'm talking about myself as like a third party here because right, always, like you're talking yourself about yourself. Like you're a brand, like you're yes, Ella or yeah, you're whatever. Exa yeah, exactly. Cause so that's people, what it is. Yeah. And so when people see me like very similar, when you saw me, you're like, Oh, I like her because she's talking her shit. Like she is confident in what she's saying. It's reality. There was a part of whatever I was filming that you were able to resonate and dial in on that you enjoy. So my goal with creating my content well, is like, that's how I'm going to attract my people because I'm literally being so authentically myself. So kind of pulled back where I'm going to attract someone like you. And I'm going to completely detract someone else who is like, whoa, she's too intense. And I'll say bye and, and welcome the people who are here for it. So like that in terms of influence, I guarantee y'all like with the most humble tone voice ever, like you won't find someone else online like me, which is what I want for you all. That's what we want. Like, that's what we want the people is like for no one else to be able to find someone like you online. And so because I just own me, that's how the influence even starts. And there's like a million technical things, right? But that piece I think is like the core reason why I have the following that I do. So many people give the line, which I, I believe they believe it because they've told themselves a story enough. Tiffany, hello. I don't know what to say in my videos. I don't even know what am I supposed to say when I share my offer on a video. I'm terrified of TikTok. Like I don't dance. So they convince themselves that they're lost and confused. Do you really think that this many people 
don't know what to say because they certainly know what to say when they're calling up their best friend, spilling some dirt they just found out about like their neighbor two houses down, right? Yeah. Or they just got a good find at TJ Maxx. Like they're not lost on what to say there. Right. I think that the thing that you were called to do is the thing you already do for free right now today. If I wanted to hire you for the skill that you're building in your head and you're like, I've been wanting to do this or I've heard people say this, ask yourself this question. Is there anything else you need to learn or be better at or do to be able to be like, if I came to you wanting that service to serve me, is there anything else? Oh, well, I would need to learn more about this or this. If you wanted to help me with whatever service you're trying to build, could you help me today? And the thing that you already do probably every single day that people come to you for, whether it's advice about it or you do it naturally and you're good at it. Do you need to learn anything else to be able to help me do that to get the same result? If the answer is no, then you have everything you need to get started. Do you mind if I get really technical? I about want you to, because that's why people listen to the show. Because most people want, they come to people with our personalities because we yeah. tell them what the fuck to do. Now yeah, I can't I make, go, we can't make them do it. We can right. help hold you accountable. If you pay us. Right. But you can't make someone, but like, we're not, uh, you're never going to say, I will never hear you say, I bet. Well, like intuit show up and in, when it's intuitively aligned. Never, <laughs> not in a million years, not in a million years. That first point that I just made for all of you guys who don't know what to do. Most people like don't know even what to do. It's not even like what to say. Most people are confused on the niche. That thing I just mentioned is the thing that you do every single day. People come to you, man, my boyfriend da, 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 for relationship advice, man, I've been really struggling, like learning how to perfect my cross, or I'm trying to figure out how, you know, I should do whatever they come to you for that thing. And you're able to fix the problem straight away. The thing that you do for free is the thing you should be charging for every single day in the career. You should be building it around. That's the first thing that you have to identify. That's the niche. After that, I always, in my content, talk about the PSA method. And I want to go through this really technically. So you have the PSA method, which is problem, solution, answer. And so for those of you, now that we've identified that niche for you, that free thing that you should be charging for, I want you to create a video. Let's say it's a minute and a half long. In this minute and a half long video, the first five seconds has to be the problem that the ideal client that is coming to you is probably experiencing. So if your friend, your homegirl calls you, and you're like, I don't know what my niche is. And she's telling you about all this relationship issues and you're giving her relationship advice and you want to become a relationship coach. And you're like, oh, I could do that. I do this all the time. Bring the book on my own time. Great. What's the problem that girl called you with? What does she call you with? Man, my boyfriend cheated on me and I'm struggling because I still want to be with him, but everyone else around me is saying I shouldn't. What should I do? Problem. Another person calls you and they're like, yo, I'm really struggling right now. We're doing long distance and I just don't know how to manage a relationship and create better communication. Problem. Those are now the headlines for the first five seconds of your video. That's the thing that needs to live above your head when you have your question. What to do when your boyfriend cheats on you? Headline. And that's also the thing that needs to come out of your mouth. What to do when your boyfriend cheats on you, but you still want to be with him. That is the first three to five seconds of every single video that you're going to create. And that problem has to be first. So it's either going to be your problem. The second option is it can be the ideal type of like the ideal result that the person desires. So this can be the problem or it can be the ideal result that the person is desiring. What do they want? How to make $30,000 a month sitting your ass on your couch. That's what someone wants. So you're going to put that as the headline. And That's literally what... say that because yeah. some people are going, oh my God, I can't say it like that. Oh no, 100%. Like you're literally going to say like how I make, I do this all the time. Like how, do, how I make daily activities I do to make 30 K a month. And the first thing is looking cute as shit to do my job. Speak your truth, whatever that is for you. So that headline has to be there. It's the first three to five seconds. It's the headline that lives at the top of your head. And then you're also going to say that in your videos. Okay. After that, you're going to go through your solution. Your solution literally needs to be the exact thing that that person has to do to yield the desired result. What we tend to do is we, we list off the problem and then we go into talking and explaining and explaining and explaining. And it's like, no, just give us the solution. Do this. If you like, if you want to be with your boyfriend and he's cheated on you, be with him. Answer. 
that that's going to be that solution piece. And then we're going to jump directly into A, which is the answer. The answer is where you explain the why, what, when, where, all the things that someone, when you give them the solution, they're probably like, what do you mean be with him? That's what they're going to say. You're going to answer that in the answer section. So PSA, problem, state the problem or the desired result that the person who wants to work with you or needs your help needs, needs to hear the solution to it, literally giving the hard truth. Don't gatekeep. Don't think because you're gatekeeping here people will want to work with you if you give all your information they're not going to want to hire you the more you can give here the better so give the fucking solution and then the answer is going to explain all the questions they have when you provide the solution and so that's how you're actually going to format all of your long form content if you're just starting out and you don't know what to do that's not what you have to stick to or, or adhere to but it's it's like a perfect place to start if you do not know how to do content do the psa method in every single long form video you ever create that is the golden ticket to all the content I create. And it's the most important thing where you give all the fucking answers, because if you can give high quality, like content that gets the person, the result from just watching a free video on TikTok, imagine what it's like to pay you money. Exactly. Imagine. And this works for any type of business, brick and mortar, you're in fitness, you have a jewelry shop, you have an Etsy shop. So you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, it works across the board. So I need to hear you. And I'm praying you have a little bit of a rant in you. Okay, because I, I, I'm kind of here for a low rant. <laughs> I'm here for it. What is your take on how many people end up buying from these fantasy marketers where it's like, get 30,000 followers in 30 days? buy my this and I'm going to teach you how to go viral and people will spend. It's not just like $99. I mean, I have clients that come to me who have joined like $45,000 programs, spent so much money and there's really little to show for it. I would love to hear what you have to say about this. If there's a guarantee run. Agreed. If there's ever a guarantee, so if someone says, I'm going to help you grow X amount of followers, run for the, for the forest, run for the bushes. If there's ever any guarantee, the reason I'll say this is because I don't think every coach or person is flawed. I don't think that they're here to scam. The thing about guarantees, especially when you're building something that um, is not extremely procedural, meaning like du incredibly duplicable. Like what I have, I can actually copy and paste for you because there's a process. If anyone ever guarantees you something, they're screwing you over just simply because they can never guarantee your work. So how can they ever guarantee anything? Like if they're going to guarantee 30,000 followers, they're essentially saying that they're going to guarantee that you're going to do all the work, put all the energy in, and you're going to do it correctly from the beginning. Because effort doesn't equal execution for, for you guys. And this is kind of like an account, account, accountability piece I want to touch on for you all before I get into like the scamming piece. When you're new at something, you're new at something. Like you've never done it before. I will explain something to someone and it will take me 10 times for me to explain to them for them to actually do it right. And it's not because they weren't wanting to put the energy in or the effort or that they weren't trying hard or that like they weren't even doing certain things or showing up on calls. They did all the things. They were showing up. They were doing it. Everything. When you're learning something for the first time ever, you're not going to perfect it. And so it's like, as, although you put all the effort in, sometimes effort doesn't equal execution and that's okay. So for someone to guarantee that you're going to help you build to make 30,000 followers, that's a bunch of bullshit because there's absolutely no way that they can guarantee that you're going to do all the things correctly straight away. Everyone has a different process. We're also working with an algorithm on TikTok specifically that you cannot fucking control. So it's literally impossible for this person to guarantee any type of result, even monetarily speaking, okay? And everyone's showing up differently in their businesses and in their life in different places. So I worked with people who were literally starting from zero, like zero, zero on social media in their business. There's no way I'm going to help them make $45,000 in a month. There's no- Right, exactly. So the point is, is like everyone's very individualized. And if you're hearing those things, you need to run for the fucking bushes. That has absolutely not like that has no weight and bears no weight on the ability that you can do. And so if anyone's ever doing that, like I said, you literally need to run for your life. Period. <laughs> I agree. I'm, I've fallen for things more so like in the health and, and fitness space. Now I call myself on it more like getting like 
I don't know, like a diet tea or some supplement or some bullshit like that. I think people also easily follow and fall for where people make it look so easy and effortless because there's this fear. And I know you have to hear this a lot. I don't want to spend all day on my phone. I don't always want to be making content. I don't always want to be glued to this. I don't want to have to do this. And so then there are people who market to you, right? right? In order to catch those people. And right. what's the truth of what goes into it for you, right? Your truth might look a little different than mine, but what is your right. truth daily that goes into you continually growing your business and your accounts? The truth that goes into it for me, first of all, when people say that stuff and they're marketing to you, what they're essentially teaching you already is that they're cutting corners, which means that they're going to have you try to cut corners when people are marketing you on a quick fix or a fast result. If it's ever a quick fix or a fast result, the answer is absolutely not. For me, the truth in my business, and this is why my following, I love my following, but this is why I only have 76,000 followers here is that people online specifically, like, yeah, 76,000 followers is a lot. And like I said, I, I'm grateful for that. But because I don't do that other marketing, that's the reason why my following is lesser. I, my audience is way more qualified because of it. My audience is way more geared and focused in on me. They're way more loyal because I'm not focusing on a quick fix and growing my following. I can produce false content. I can romanticize entrepreneurship. I can make it all sound cute and beautiful and all those things. But what it's going to do is it's going to bring me in a bunch of people who are kind of fluffy or, or filler followers who don't, who aren't ever going to buy from me. So within me creating my own content, the reason I'm so forward with my truth is because that is essentially what I even teach my clients when they come in. Your first opportunity to sell is the video that you're creating. And so if I, even if you, if you worked with me right now and you saw my video and you're like, wow, Lo's amazing. She's going to help me do this and this. How disappointed would you be when we got on a sales call together and I either promised you that same thing and we never got it. Or when we got on a sales call, I have to not sell you on something else because I really can't help you do that. It would be, there would be no parallel. So the credibility and trust for me is incredibly important, which is why I come up, I show up so authentically. And also what I teach my clients with what they create in their businesses is the same process that I do. The integrity in the content they're creating to get them the result is going to help them build their business in the long term, or it's going to be the thing that's actually going to destroy it. And I think like, that's the reason why I lead with it the way that I do, because at the end of the day, everyone wants a simpler, easier way to do something. They want to cut the corners. And then when they get on a sales call with me, they want, they also want the $10,000 pro problem to cost $10 because I'm making it sound so mm -hmm. easy. I've already lost the sales call because that person is going to assume that the $10,000 problem that they're having is only going to cost $10. And when I pitch them that it actually costs 20,000, they're like, oh, and so what I'm doing is I'm setting myself up for failure on that sales call, but I'm also setting them up for failure too. And I'm, I'm kind of bombarding them. And then we get mad at the person. Like I didn't close the sales call. This person didn't really understand my value. No, bitch. It's because you didn't articulate that in your video in the first place. You didn't say it in a way that was going to tell them how hard it was really going to be. And because of that, when you get on that call, the expectation is like, oh, easy, because it's easy. It's going to be like, not that much money and da, da, da. And they get on there and they think it's kiki cuckoo. And they get on there and you drop the 20K price and they're like, oh, and you're like, well, what did you expect? But they expected what you sold them in your first video which is the first such, opportunity to get this. Such a great point. Are you on your phone working it, doing content, doing all the things? Are you working like eight, 10 hours a day? What does it really look like? So when I first started my first two years, I was working 24, eight. What's 24, that mean? Like all the time. So not 24, seven, but like 24, eight, like all. Oh, the damn. Time. Really? Yes. My first two years. I had to grind and was grinding so, so much in my business because I was literally starting from zero. I was transitioning from athlete to entrepreneur. So, and there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. I was trying to cut down my learning curve. Like I had so much learning to do. I studied biology. I was going to be a doctor. I was going to go to medical school and from college. I didn't know anything about business. Yeah, that makes sense. That's I hear. I thought you're going to tell me like 24, eight is some like special, like accountability time concept or something. The oh. last thing I thought you were going to say is you were really, but that makes sense, right? Yeah. Like you were genuinely starting from zero because Absolutely it's zero. not like 
I went to school for broadcast journalism. So I at least had, right. Like I'm already a writer. I had, I was a little further along. I knew nothing. I knew zero. I was starting from zero. So my first two years, I had to like really figure this shit out. And I was working 24 eight in my own business. Plus I had nothing else to rely on because I was making below poverty in soccer. I had to make a living. So I was fucking grinding. So for all you people who are maybe in that place right now, I see you. But over the course of the past couple of years, I now work when I want to, how I want to. Back then I was, again, because I was so new and so immature and I didn't know what I was doing. The first thing I did was I hired a mentor straight away who was making eight figures. I spent $35,000. I spent everything I owned in my life before I even started my business because I didn't want to spend five or 10 years having to figure this shit out. So I hired someone, I spent $35,000, which at the age of 23 was like, that was the most amount of money I'd ever spent in my entire life. Like that was everything I'd saved from college, like all the things, right? Spent that money and had to learn. I made a lot of mistakes and a lot of the work I was doing was useless because I had to undo shit that I had done that was wrong. And that's why I worked 24 eight because I was fucking up, but I was learning fast, failing fast and making it happen. So now heading into like these upcoming years, like even this year alone, I would say on average, I work about, I have my day really scheduled out. I'm a really type A person. So in the morning, the first thing that I do is I wake up and I straight away work out. I don't do anything else. Then after that, I have my first call starts at 11 a.m. every single day. That's with my team. Then after that, I have my client calls. And the second part of my day, I'm working on my business. And so that's that's things like building out landing pages. Like I do everything internal. I don't outsource any of this stuff. And I honestly, like if I want to make it to becoming an eight-figure earner, I will need to do those things. Okay. I will need to outsource that stuff. And so everyone who puts into this understand that's where you need to go. But I've always wanted to learn these skills for myself because everything that I do in my business is actually tailored and created by me and two other people that I have who actually work with inside my business. I don't use any third parties and I do not outsource. I've tried those things. I've done those things, but I hire the mentor. So every year I hire a mentor to become an expert in a specific space. And so Now in this year, really focusing on becoming, taking on seven figure and eight figure habits versus six figure habits. So six figure habits are the things that you're going to keep having to do over and over again. It's a thing that's going to make you money for right now, but it's not going to help you build your business later. So some of the things that I'm learning right now that I'm taking on this year is Facebook ad. And I am focusing on optimizing landing pages this way. When I do outsource these things in the future, which I've actually started to do a little bit, I know where my money is going and that's important to me. I've yeah. doubled my income and profit every year. Hell yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's clear to everyone, right? You hire help to shave off a significant amount of time and the learning curve. You show up, you do your part over and over and over again, and then you continue to learn and then grow more and then tackle and grow more and tackle and grow more. It's not sexy. It's not a sexy answer, no. but uh, it's straight up truth. I mean, it's, right. No different than what I've done with both of my businesses. I've just been doing it longer because I'm older than you, right? Like it's same exact thing. And it's the unsexy things in business that end up making you the most money and will actually get you the most influence. But a lot of people aren't willing to do the unsexy work. They just want, oh, Tiffany, I want to speak on stage like you. I want to be interviewed on TV. Well, guess what? That's like where the least amount of my money is made. Right, right. Boredom boredom kills more entrepreneurs than anything else in business. Yeah. So let's talk about this she created, which is so fucking generous and it was unexpected. She created something she's calling the ultimate bundle and it's 60% off literally for you guys. So will you tell the people what this is all about? Because I you're going to take action from listening to this. So let the people know what does this ultimate bundle, what using your PSA. Yeah. Yeah. So the ultimate bundle, like for most of you guys who are here, you probably struggle with growing your influence online. You have a business, you have a message, something that you want to do. So what I've done is I've actually created this conglomerate of literally every offer I have in my business. So what I do is I host three Q and a call the week on zoom. 
people unmute themselves. It's very unscripted. It's very straight to the point. It's Q and A and it's rapid fire. Whatever your question is exactly what I'm going to answer. And I do it on zoom so I can share my screen. I do a lot of like screen sharing and example because I'm very visual. So that's why I lean more into doing three calls like this instead of doing the texting or doing the group community bullshit because I'm not a fluffy person. I'm not going to, I'm very dry when I text too. So you're probably going to be a little bit offended. I'd rather like be on a call with you and like, we can like chat about it and like laugh about it. And like, I can, I can kind of make fun of you and you, you feel better about it sort of thing. You're also going to have access to like my community. So this is where you can drop in your questions throughout the week as you're like confused. Again, sometimes I'll answer them in them, but I really want to bring it to the call. So the whole point is like, if as you have questions, can you write them down? And then you guys are also going to have access to all of my courses, which one is my six figure sales Academy. I told you guys, like I hired a mentor. I spent 10 grand to like, become an expert in sales. I created a full on course. And again, completely non-bullshit. It's probably really dense. Like you're like, whoa, this is a lot of information, but it is literally everything you need to close up to $60,000, $100,000 clients on call to get paid up front and full. I have spent number one, so much money, so much time building this out. But you guys, when I tell you, when I learned this method, it literally changed my entire fucking life. I don't take any sales call differently because of the way that I have learned this method. And I guarantee it, like this is something I do guarantee. So when I say this right now, don't run. I guarantee if you can learn this, and this is actually a stat in my business, your sales are going to increase by 90% on call. This is a stat. I have all my clients, something that I track. Dang. This process, you are going to be able to sell ice to an Eskimo. And it's also something I teach within my Q&A calls too. So what's cool is like, I'll do Q&A, but if there's a certain topic that I feel like is really important, like the actual selling sequence, walking through it or developing your pitch. Like I'll go through that on call. And then you're going to get my full on how to grow on TikTok bundle, which is going to teach you from beginning to end everything. And I say everything. I went so fundamental with it where I almost was like, I don't even know if people are going to want this, but like how to find trending audios, like how to find the right one. No, they do want that. Oh, well, I mean, I went like, for me, it's like, duh. But I mean, for some people, like I didn't, I just started from the beginning. I was like, let me just pretend that this is your first day on TikTok. I created this exact like bundle where you just need to watch from beginning to end how to actually grow on TikTok. I'm literally going to take, I've literally packaged up and put into a bundle so you can walk through and learn that. And these are also concepts that on my Q&A calls I teach. So if there aren't a ton of questions, I always have a concept that I'm like, this is what y'all need to hear. Let's go through this today. So in this bundle, this is something you'll have access to for a full year. And oh it's something that genuinely, yeah, genuinely, like I was talking to my CEO before the call and I was like, I really want to do this because I, I'm telling you guys, if you guys could just literally sit down and learn the things you need to learn specifically for TikTok, the way it's changed my life, like honestly, not even just TikTok, but the processes I've learned, whether it's on Instagram or TikTok or LinkedIn, because everything is synonymous. If you can learn your niche, if you can learn to find your own voice and your own authority and feel comfortable enough to bring that forward and know that people will accept that. And if you could from there generate the leads and the people who are your people and get on calls with the people and actually know how to close them, you'll increase your prices. You'll feel confident pitching what you have. So that's everything in the bundle. There's just so much opportunity and I would love to see you guys all there. So yeah. swipe up. It's in the show notes and then you can go follow low underscore silver on TikTok and then your low silver underscore on yeah, so on Instagram. TikTok, it's low underscore silver. And then on Instagram, it's low silver underscore. I've got a lot of low silvers. Honestly, if you just type in low silver, you'll probably see me. I'm like always going to pop up. But yeah, I would love to see you guys there. Shoot me a follow. And yeah, I just want to help you guys grow. So you know what I'm saying? And my content, if you can't afford this, guys, also just follow me. Because if you watch all of my content for free, this is something I 100% can guarantee because I've already gotten multiple different testimonials from random ass people who just followed my content. They didn't join any of my offers. They didn't do anything else. They just followed my content. If you do not have a budget, follow me and watch my shit and study it. And y'all can really build a six figure. Her, con her content's legit. Like she wouldn't have made it on the show. You guys know I'm discerning and she gives it straight up. And it's like, it might take you aback because she's like very, very blunt, but the shit's on point. And I would rather you hear from someone who's that direct and high integrity where the stuff actually works than listen to people telling you what you want to hear where the shortcuts and making it sound easy. Cause the real shortcut is the long way. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's like, I like that. That's good. <laughs> well, that turned that into some content, right? There. 
Welcome. All right. I like that. I want to write that down. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show, babe. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really appreciate you all.